Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for invite me, inviting me to attend and contribute to this event. It has been most interesting until now. And in particular, the increase in heat stress and extreme precipitation that we saw in the recent past has been really quite striking in the presentation. And generally, I think we cannot really overstate the importance of this work. It has been mentioned, but it's obvious that when we look at the consequences of extreme events in terms of financial and human losses, we need to better quantify the risks caused by these events, and especially in the context of the current climate crisis. And these synthetic indicators, um, supporting the activities of actuaries in particular, show how this should be done in collaboration with the relevant sectors of the economy, and in particular with insurance uh, in mind in this case. So Chiara also presented other examples. She presented the example with CMCC, as she explained, uh, that looked at the future risk of pluvial flooding in cities to support disaster risk reduction. So that's also a very relevant example. I can also mention that we, uh, we have also developed a catalog of windstorms for Europe, which was also developed in close collaboration interaction with the insurance sector. So it is a bit of a similar study and it provided the, as well, again, an example of how it is possible to go from physical risks to the financial estimate of the damages, such as the total insured losses per year due to windstorm. So as presented by Chiara at ECMWF in the context of the Copernicus Climate Service, which we operate on behalf of the EU, we are also contributing to these sort of studies such as the innovative uh, eCube CI uh, service presented today. So I think, Maybe to broaden it, where else could this information about climate risk and extremes be used? Well, obviously, it can be used to help um, to drive adaptation. I think Chiara mentioned it quickly, but how can we adapt buildings? And we've started um, building methodologies to investigate how the estimates of extremes can be used to design new building standards, for example. But also, how do we adapt agriculture, energy production? And like many sectors, organizations, and businesses, financial institutions will also be affected by the climate, the changing climate. And the risks that come with climate change will need to be included in financial disclosures, which make financial information available to investors and other stakeholders. So as you know, the, the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, was launched a few years back to develop climate-related financial risk disclosures for companies to align their disclosures with the needs of the stakeholders. And ultimately it's used to integrate climate related risk into decision-making. So it will be relevant for all aspects of the economy. But when financial institution conducts analysis of climate risk, they need data on climate hazards and assets for sure. But processing this climate data need strong expertise in manipulation data management and also a good understanding of our jargon a bit in the climate community. On top of it, that, that it, we are lacking a standard methodology, reference data sets, and this means that service providers and financial institutions work with different sources, different approaches for studying the same risk hazard. So as a result, the comparison of the different assessment outcomes is almost impossible. So for Copernicus, we are assembling a data set of climate hazard that will be a reference, we hope, for assessing physical risks that aligns with the TCFD recommendation. So building an authoritative public and up-to-date reference hazards data set will benefit the financial industry. It will promote the development of a standard methodology and it will support institutions in their way of thinking in the forward-looking uh, climate resilience strategies. So this is another area that will benefit from climate information. So, I've mentioned these different areas. So insurance, of course, which is directly related to this topic, uh, that disaster risk reduction, climate adaptation, financial disclosure. So there are many more sectors that will benefit for better tools like the one shown today to quantify extremes in the changing climate. I would just like to finish by saying, you know, what, 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 where do we see the future as well? How can we go further in, to support all these applications and how do we see the long-term future? 
So first of all, it's very important that Copernicus continues to involve and bring authoritative climate information for all to use and for all to build tools on, uh, like this has been shown today. But also what we need on top of these high quality information is for various users to easily interact with climate information, to bring it together with their own data and their own tools so that they can provide the information directly relevant to them. And in particular, the definition of extreme is quite user dependent. Uh, so an extreme for an application will be a bit different from an extreme for another one, which will be less dependent. So more interactivity will be useful in that respect. So the climate data store provided by Copernicus is already providing a sort of interactivity. And the DSCs, in particular Wikio, which are data information and access services developed in the context of Copernicus is already going a long way into providing uh, data and information along processing resources, computing resources, tools, and other relevant data. But to really satisfy the user's need, I think we need to go even further. We need this climate data store and we need the DSCs and all these tools to scale up considerably. So in the same way, you know, although, uh, and Chiara has shown that the uh, improvement in the reanalysis has been going on, but the quality of what we provide is high. It is gold standard. I think we can't hide that we are providing very good information that people can rely on to build their tools. But with more data and more computing power, we could provide much more. And this is exactly what the newly announced Destination Earth or Destiny initiative from the European Union proposes. So it's one of the initiatives identified in the European strategy for data building on the Green Deal data space. And I think what's important to note is that the European Green Deal actually goes hand in hand with the digital transition. So, you know, we've been talking in the introduction about AI, and I think this initiative really, uh, it culminates these, uh, the, the, the marriage between the Green Deal and the digital transition, it culminates in this initiative, which combined the EU's investment and activities in AI, in supercomputing, we talked about the large supercomputer like Leonardo, in cloud computing and in, of course, connectivity networks and earth observations that will really bring together European scientific and very importantly, industrial excellence, which is a bit one of the goal of, the, of this foundation. So Destination Earth or Destiny aims to develop a very high precision digital model of the earth to anticipate, monitor, better understand and react in time to the challenge uh, of climate change. So, this is what we call a digital twin of the Earth. So it's a sort of living digital replica of the Earth that will give us the knowledge that we need to protect our planet's future. So it is combining the physical world. You know, we have the knowledge, of course, of the real physical world, the atmosphere, the ocean, the land. And, but also you have dynamic models, so the simulation of the Earth. And the digital twin will be driven by this advanced modeling, but also AI and it will be fed by the continuous measurements, the observations, the data from the real physical world. And that's combining this information that we can provide uh, some insights into how our planet works. So in the context of Destination Earth, there will be this digital twin of the Earth will have unprecedented precision, providing forecasts of floods, of droughts, of fires, really with a very high precision from days to years in advance. It will also incorporate real-time da real data that will be, for instance, provided by society, like energy use, traffic patterns, human movements tracked by mobile phones, for instance. And finally, as I mentioned, it will, be, it will make use of AI and sophisticated data analytics. So this is really a truly planetary scale information system that will reveal not just how weather and climate evolve, but also how human actions manifest globally. And what's important is that it will have this interactivity. Users will be able to create their what if scenarios and replay simulation based on various hypotheses. So the European Commission will lead this initiative and coordinate implementation efforts between three implementation um, agencies. So ECMWF is one of them together with ESA and UMETSAT. So I think 
just a link between Copernicus and destination. So this is really the long-term vision in the next few years. As you, we've talked a lot about Copernicus, the destinationers will build on Copernicus and on Earth's, Earth observation capacity, which is really in Europe, an area where Europe is leader. It will add the cutting edge supercomputer dimension and the AI, in particular in the context also of EuroHPC, and it will allow full interactivity of the users with the digital twins on, of the Earth. So in that sense, Destination Earth will really provide cutting edge developments that will feed into the future activity, activities of Copernicus, where will we continue to deliver operational climate services and data to the users for them to build applications like the one presented today. So in that sense, Copernicus and Destination Earth are very complementary. So all this is very ambitious. So I prepare, I presented a very broad vision of what we could do over Europe, really extensive developments, combining the private sector and the, the public entities and all these cutting edge developments. But I think really the, the study presented here today is an excellent example of what is the state of the art today. And these sort of activities will really flourish, I think, in the future, in the context of the developments in the science and in the technology as the ones I've just mentioned in Copernicus and Destination Earth. And I will conclude there. Thank you very much.